Well, I'm glad that you guys are here. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, which most of you should know who I am by this point, my name is Mike Spence, and I'm one of the Bible teachers here at Southwood. And we have been going through a journey over the last year or so through First Timothy. And so we're going to do the next two installments of that this morning. And Lord willing, and really Mike time willing, I'm being honest, uh, we'll get through chapter one by making no promises. So if you notice, I have a part three because I named the last two videos this and never got to the verse that actually said that. So we've got a part three and a part four. So in the future, I'll just extend them so that it works out. So, well, I also want to uh, draw attention to two of my students who are out here, and I want to note this fancy schmancy tie that they got me for Christmas. It's their yellow jacket colors, the gold and purple. And so thank you, Ephraim and Eli. So here's who I'm talking about for YouTube. Oh, yes. And uh, yeah, I don't know who the uh, Hispanic guy is. Uh, and then this is the rest of my class. And so the reason I show, yeah, and I'm, I'm missing Ellie, but the reason I'm showing this is, you know, in the context of First Timothy, one of the first lessons I gave in First Timothy was about the concept of mentorship, mentorship and protégés. And so that's kind of an overarching theme in First Timothy. You have the Apostle Paul and his student. And so rather than just the relational aspect, which is great, there's something deeper that we're going to get into this morning that's going on specifically with Paul and Timothy's relationship. And we'll hone in on that a little bit. But again, the mentor-protege relationship is super important in this book between teachers and students, stewards and those being stewarded. and Really, the main point and the main content of Paul and Timothy's relationship uh, between the, him being a mentor and Timothy being a protege is doctrine. So if you guys remember, I told a story in one of the first lessons that we did, and it was about a boarding school that I used to work for called Shelterwood. And I went up there and spent a year up there working with teenagers, and I spent the entire time I was up there working diligently to connect them to myself. I thought I was doing a great job uh, mentoring. And then I left. And one of the things I recognized when I left is, hmm, I spent all this time pouring myself out to these students, and now I'm gone. And I spent all of that time connecting them to me and not to something that they can hold on to when I'm not there. So that was a big lesson for me. And so I missed the big point. And the big point that we've been seeing in First Timothy is Paul is not just passing off, spending time with Timothy and pouring into Timothy his wisdom. Paul is passing doctrine to Timothy. And that's why I really want to hone in on this morning. So I have a few questions for us to consider here at Southwood. So the first one, for you guys to consider, and I want you to think about these as we, work, as we work through this lesson together. Why do you think that we put such great emphasis on the verse-by-verse -verse teaching here at Southwood? Question number one. Question number two is, what does it mean to grow? What does it really mean to grow in the Christian life? How is that done? Question three, why does sound, correct doctrine even matter? Why does it matter? Question four, what are the consequences, if any, of poor doctrinal teaching? Question five is, why is Paul so adamant that Timothy hold the line with Paul's doctrine in Ephesus? Why is he so urgent with Timothy? And number six, we'll really discuss at the end of our time together this morning, at the end of the second class, it's an application question. How do all these questions and the answers to them and the implications <laughs> relate to me personally? How do those relate? So you've seen these before, have you not? It's been a little bit, six to seven months, but here we go. See, I, I snuck it in there. There's always a recap. You just, gotta, you just gotta know that with me. So who wrote the letter? Paul, right? The apostle Paul. We're gonna go faster this time though. So the letter was written to Timothy, Paul's disciple. When was it written? Approximately 62 to 66 AD, sometime during that time frame. Uh, it's post-first imprisonment in Rome for Paul. From where was it written? Well, probably Macedonia, 
We see a reference to this in 1 Timothy 1, 3. What was the occasion for writing? Well, there's false teachers there, and that's going to be a theme in a lot of the epistles and other books of the Bible. But false teachers and also church order, there's some specific instructions that Paul gives Timothy in this book. What's the outline of 1 Timothy? Well, again, doctrinal and instruction, and also to encourage Timothy. There's content in there that's really personal. The main theme, if you could boil it down in one word, some have said it's godliness, and it's related to Christ's body, and that has everything to do with doctrine as well. Now, what's the purpose for 1 Timothy? Well, correcting doctrine and also conduct. And what are some unique characteristics of the letter? Well, it's personal, like I said previously. It's authoritative. There's aspects of women in ministry, and it's also a pastoral. It's one of the what's been dubbed the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. So there you have it. If you don't have a picture of it, snap a picture of it now. I'll give you a second. All right, moving on. So now we've got, if you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 20. I would like to hear the rustling of the Bible pages as we turn there. I'm going to read the section, and I am going to cheat. I have it on here. And as you're turning there, I'm going to read you something from last time that kind of ties together all of where we've been. So Paul wrote this letter to Timothy upon his release from his first Roman imprisonment in approximately 60 to 64, 62 to 64 AD. He is then rearrested later sometime in the year 66 to 67 AD. It is within these years that he pens the pastoral epistles, one to his student Titus with the other two letters being written to Timothy. Paul had either visited Ephesus or discovered by some other means that there was false teaching happening within the assembly there. And this false teaching was running contrary to what he had not only previously taught to those whom he had appointed to teach there, but also the doctrine that he's taught Timothy. Paul charges Timothy to remain in Ephesus as a representative of himself in order to correct those doctrinal issues and to reestablish Paul's teachings regarding church order and conduct. With a letter written by the apostle himself to rely upon if needed, Timothy was tasked with correcting this false doctrine by reinforcing the Pauline doctrine that he had received from his teacher. As Timothy opens the letter for the first time, he reads the words that we've been studying in this first chapter. So that's what we've kind of left off at. And so at this point, you should be in Acts chapter 20. So we're going to read through this together. And this is really kind of the background. This is, this is the account of Paul's final charge to the elders at Ephesus before he moves on. So it reads as follows, Acts 20, 17 and following. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Now we get to the meat of it. And now, behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. And then in verse 28, we read, be on guard for yourselves. And here's the stewardship part for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will 
arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, again, be on alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So Paul gives the exhortation to the Ephesian elders, and not so many years later, here we are, studying through 1 Timothy. And Timothy has, ta- has been tasked with going to Ephesus, remaining on Ephesus, and fixing the errors there. So did the Ephesian elders do a sound job? Something happened there, and Timothy has been charged to do it. So we already read through this. So chapter one at a glance, Paul's salutation to Timothy, verses one through two, and then Paul gives Timothy the command to stay at Ephesus to correct false teaching that is counter to his doctrine that he received from Christ, and that does not for God, which is by the faith. Verses three through six. Next, we observe here in the text that the first thing The first thing on the docket for Paul concerning false doctrine at Ephesus is a misappropriation of the law. How how many of you guys remember us doing legalism in this lesson? Absolutely, it pops up everywhere. So a misappropriation of the law for justification and sanctification. And Paul charges Timothy to address these individuals who are destroying the gospel of Christ, the true doctrine of soteriology by mixing in works as a means of salvation and growth. That's verse seven. And we read in Acts, we just read in Acts, where Paul addresses the overseers at Ephesus of this very issue. And alas, here we are. Oh, we already discussed this. So I do have a quick note for you, a quick note on the term disciple here in this context. This is not referring to one of the 12, right? but rather those who are under doctrinal teaching in a church setting at Ephesus. And the term here carries the more general sense of those who engage in learning through instruction from another, a learner, a pupil, or a student. So I want you to kind of have that in mind as well. And that that certainly fits with the protege and mentor theme that we have going. So moving on in 8 through 11, Paul then reiterates to Timothy the correct doctrine concerning the Mosaic law, specifically as well as general law also. Not because Timothy doesn't know these things, but more than likely, so Timothy has the correction in Paul's own handwriting, handwritten print rather, to employ as needed in Ephesus towards those who may oppose him. That would be a very handy thing to have a letter from the Apostle Paul himself. So that's 8 through 11. And then once Paul reiterates the true relationship of the law to mankind, that it shows them their sin and leads them to their Savior, he drives the importance of the gospel message home by discussing the results of the gospel that is not distorted by misconceptions of law. And he uses his, himself as the example, as a pattern of God's intent towards mankind. And we read the trustworthy statement. Christ came to what? Save sinners, which Paul was the foremost. And as he reflects in this letter to Timothy, how God's grace personally impacted him, Paul concludes his testimony with a doxology in honor of God. And that brings us right back to where we were last time when we left off. So I promised that I would unpack the terms in the doxology. So if you would, flip over from Acts to 1 Timothy, if you're not already there, to 1 Timothy, yes, chapter 1, <laughs> verse 17, and we'll read from there. My 1 Timothy page is really brown, and all the other pages are really white. So, All right. I'll give you a moment to get there, and a moment for me to get there. All right. 1 Timothy 1.17, the doxology. Paul has just finished describing everything that Christ has done for him and works himself up into a doxology where he gives praise to God and says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, there is a debate on the intent of this doxology. More specifically, who is this doxology directed towards? There are two predominant views. The the doxology could be directed towards God the Father. And the doxology, the other view is the doxology is not directed 
towards any specific person in the Trinity, but it has been noted that it's a minor view, not definitely not the majority view, directed towards Christ specifically because of some of the attributes that we'll read through here. So I'm going to read some various perspectives here on this doxology. So Guthrie concludes, a typical Pauline doxology is, doxology is called forth by these moving reflections on the mercies of God. New features not found in earlier examples admittedly appear. So that's what Guthrie says. There's some aspects in here that aren't in other doxologies that Paul gives. But there is the same all-absorbing adoration of God and the same sense of majesty of God the Father. So that's Guthrie's perspective. Now, the Bible Knowledge Commentary has a really brief one. It just states, King of the Ages emphasizes God's sovereignty over all the ebb and flow of human history. So it's very quick, very brief summary. So again, a a paying homage to God the Father in this doxology. Uh, Kent writes, a great majority of commentators refer to this doxology to God the Father. Only in rare instances does anyone understand the reference to be to Christ. However, the anarthrist, which means no definite article present, use of theoi, or plural God, suggests that Paul is not attempting to isolate or distinguish the persons of the Godhead, but is ascribing his praise to God in a generic sense. That is, a triune God. If one must distinguish, then this writer must assert that some of the terms fit the Father more easily than Christ, i.e. invisible, only God. But he feels that the explanation of the triune God is a solution to the difficulty. So that is Kent's persuasion. And here's mine. I don't really care (laughs) if I'm being honest with you. So because overall, the conclusion of who the doxology to isn't of great import to me because it's all the same. It's to God. The gospel is sourced from and is the glory of God himself. And the work of the gospel is Christ's. And so to me, it doesn't really drastically impact the theology much. For example, it is true that the gospel and plan of salvation is from God the Father through Christ and that both are members of the Godhead. Can we agree on that? I hope so. Uh, as stated in previous lesson in the First Timothy series, the gospel is from the blessed God himself. Where did I go? And simultaneously, the content of the gospel that saves is the work of the Son of God at Calvary. So I don't have an issue seeing it either way, but I will present some observations to you and I'll let you hermeneutically come to some conclusions for yourself. Sound good? Because I did that lesson a little bit ago. <laughs> so hopefully you guys are here for that. So I would suggest we just focus on the words themselves as we go through this. So let's start here with the King Eternal. So for study's sake, let's examine the idea of the King Eternal in the context of stewardship and Paul's contextual references to Christ. Now, I think it's interesting, it's interesting to me at least, that there's a reference, and it's first on the list, to the king. Who is writing this? Paul, right? Paul is an apostle. Is Paul Jewish? He is certainly Jewish. Uh, Does he have an understanding of the promised Messiah? He certainly does. And so first on the list to Paul in his doxology is a reference to the king. Specifically, the king eternal. Now, we'll see two words here, and they're on the screen. You've got basileos, which is king, and a form of ionios, or ionion, as it shows here, which is describing never-ending or of the ages, of the ages. So a more literal rendering of this is to the king of the ages. Okay, I think that's pretty interesting. So if you look up the term to the king of the ages, you get it in one other context, and that's in Revelation 15, verse 3. So pop over there, if you wouldn't mind, because I don't have it for you. So. <laughs> We're going to have the page turn. If you can't find it, I don't know what to do for you. It's the book into the Bible, so. Just kidding. Just kidding. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. And this is interesting. This is foreshadowing to our 
fall conference. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. King of the nations. So king of the nations there. If you look, you might have a little superscript by it. And it will say that in a couple early manuscripts, it's been rendered as king of the ages, which is interesting. So you can pop back over to 1 Timothy with, you, with me if you want. So it's possible and it's persuasive to conclude that the context here suggests that in view of Revelation 15, with Jesus obviously in view, that Paul could possibly be paying homage to Christ in his doxology, particularly because this whole thing has been about Christ's doctrine and the charge that Jesus has given to Paul specifically. So regardless, however which way you take it, uh, the term king should not be overlooked. That in a doxological list on the contextual coattails, of Paul's personal testimony of what Jesus Christ has done for him, he chooses this term in the first of the list. I think that's very interesting. And so kind of carrying that on through, regardless of which way you want to take it, whether or not it's a reference to God the Father as king and sovereign over all of his creation, or Jesus Christ as king, future king, and reigning king, regardless of how you take it, I'd like for us to look at just the idea of kingship and tie it into the theme of stewardship. Throughout human history, mankind, if they've done one thing well, it's this. They've demonstrated that they're really horrible stewards. Uh, that can be seen in the beginning of Genesis. They're given one job, and that is to just not do the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And they eat of it, and then they are done, right? So their stewardship comes to an abrupt end. It's, if you were looking at the Bible, which it kind of is a, an epic story, uh, the uh, I guess falling action, if you want to put it that way, is uh, really early in the book, if you want to define it that way. And so we see throughout human history that mankind, when they're left to their own devices, is not able to restore themselves to their position of stewardship, are they? Uh, they're given some time. They're given some time post-Eden, and what happens is the son of Adam kills his brother. That's the first thing you read about. So that's great. And then we let time continue to go on. It gets worse and worse and worse. And then God goes, I regret making man. So I'm going to save one family and I'm going to judge mankind. And so we have a big reset happen. And then we kick the story back off. And everyone's like, all right, Noah, you're going to do a great job. And Noah does not do a great job starting out. I covered that in the Genesis conference. He did some interesting things. Uh, it wasn't grape juice, guys. Uh, so, so Noah starts us off on the wrong foot, and then we read a little bit further into chapter 11 of Genesis, and we read that mankind gets back together, and what do they do? They're like, we're going to build a tower to God, to the heavens. And Josephus tells us that the purpose for which they were doing that is to, uh, uh, to avoid a second flood judgment from God. So mankind is not doing a great job of the stewardship thing. And so what I want to point out to you this uh, from one of my professors at seminary that I really uh, appreciate is that God, in order to restore mankind to a position of stewardship, must intervene. He must intervene. And the way that we see that occur in the text is the unilateral, one-sided covenants, the promises that he makes to mankind, specifically to Abraham himself. And there are others. But it's God moving towards man. And I hope that we all agree that that's really the theme of the Bible, is it not? That God moves towards man. It's the story of what God has done for man and not what mankind can do for God. And so God's strategy, if you will, is the covenant promises. And through the covenant promises comes the one that this book has been predominantly about, or his doctrine rather, is Jesus Christ, the King, the long-awaited one, the Messiah that will save his people from their sins. And so when he comes and does the work at Calvary, we now have the strategy in place, but by believing upon him, we have a means to participate in the reigning and ruling in the future kingdom. But it was him paving the way. Me, with Paul, an understanding of his own stewardship of, 
of the doctrine of Christ and then passing that stewardship off to Timothy. I, I can't help but think that in his mind, whenever he mentions now to the king of the ages, if he's re- referencing Christ in this sense or not, that he might have in his mind the ultimate steward in all of human history, which is Jesus Christ himself. There's a reason why he's called the last Adam, by the way. He finishes the work that Adam could not do, and that is he is victorious in the same realm that he was seemingly defeated in, and he must be. So he will rule and he will reign. So he is the ultimate steward. Now, moving on, we've got another term that we have to unpack here. It's the Greek word translated as immortal, and it's up, I'm going to try to say this, arstarto, which is an adjective, okay? And so it's rendered as not being able to be broken down and thus lasting forever. So that's what one comes to whenever they do a word study on a term, and one sees that that's generally the overall sense, but there are other various senses as well in the semantic range of the word. We learned about that kind of last week in the hermeneutics talk that I gave. The various senses, or actually the week before, the various senses and usages are also incorruptible, imperishable, immortal, undecaying, etc. So flip over, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We will see another occurrence of this term. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. I'm going to pick up and read here. All right, that you keep the commandment with it. Now, this is still to Timothy, right? That you, Timothy, keep the commandment without strain or stain, rather, or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. That you keep the commandment until the, oh, I have that twice, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality. There's that word there, immortality. And dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So the context here, interestingly enough, suggests that the second pronoun, he, the one mentioned as the he there, is God the Father, who's doing the sending of the Son in the future at the appointed time, at the appropriate time, which I think is interesting. It's also interesting that he resides in unapproachable light. So we've got some nuances in the doxology. Are you guys seeing that a little bit? So we've got some other things as well to look through. So invisible. The term here rendered invisible is the word orato. That was my best guess at that. With a range of meaning, including unseen, not visible, that, that which cannot be seen. We see the same word employed in Colossians 1, 15 through 16. If you would like to turn there, go for it. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 16. And I will read that. So he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So we see the occurrence of that term twice in that context, invisible God and things which are visible and invisible. So this also supports an understanding that with his doxology, Paul is alluding to God the Father as there is a distinction in Colossians of Christ being the visible manifestation of God the Father, which is very interesting to me. And we'll have one more word to unpack here. And so here it is, only God. Now, what was very confusing to me, and I'll have to get with Jack after this, is I actually had two interlinears, and one interlinear included a Greek word that wasn't in the other interlinear. So I was very confused. So I'll have to look into that. But I'm going based off of the interlinear that I bring and I use, So if you have a copy and a word is in there that I'm about to discuss, see me afterwards and we'll discuss it. But in my translation, I see in the Greek, ano theu, one God, okay? 
or monotheos, which is interesting. So the literal reading is monotheo, meaning one God. Some translations will read the only wise God. I don't know how many of you have that in your Bible. The only wise God. That's interesting to me. And so it's, it might be, and I'll have to look into it a little bit more, it might be a little bit grammatically, technically not right there, but it's found somewhere else. So if you flip over to Romans 16, you will see where there is a very similar passage. So it's Romans 16, 27. It's also up on the screen. I gave you that one. So there you go. The so Romans 6 and 27 reads this way, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. So it is in that Romans passage, but in this passage, we see this manu, mono theo. Okay. So that is the unpacking of the doxology. So I'm going to read it one more time. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, or to age to age, amen, or so be it. Okay. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read that section, because when we look at contextual hermeneutics and contextual Bible study, and we break it up in the verse by verse, look at the words and the grammar, sometimes you lose the impact of reading it all together in its context or its pericope. So we're going to read that together. Uh, so it's 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17, and then we'll move on to 18. Sound good? Here we go. So he starts off with his thankfulness. So he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy or I was mercied because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And it is a trustworthy statement, Timothy, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. And now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And he pauses and shifts gears. So we're going to do likewise. So shift gears with me over to verse 18. See, I'm on track. We did like 30 minutes and I've got like four verses left. So Jack, we're going to finish. We're going to finish. But he goes, we'll see. <laughs> so here we go. We've got 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18 now. So we'll read that together. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. Interesting. So how many of you recognize this is almost a reiteration verbatim from a previous passage? He's reiterating a charge. He's reiterating a command. He's reiterating that something has been entrusted to Timothy. And what we've waxed on previously is that the thing that Timothy has received is the very doctrine that Jesus gave to Paul himself. And so you have a stewardship of a stewardship of a stewardship. Do you guys remember that? Jesus Christ was sent to steward a mission towards mankind. Did he complete that mission? You bet he did, right? We all sit here and hope because he did, right? We have a hope. We had assuredness because of his completion of his mission. So he did a great job because he's the ultimate steward, right? But also he gave Paul something to do. Paul is also a steward. He is stewarding doctrine. He's stewarding the grace of God, the gospel itself. And so as Paul continues in his ministry, he recognizes, and I want you to hone in on this because you're going to start to see themes pop up because Andrew Friend gave a lesson, I gave a hermeneutics lesson, you'll see us imploring you in a certain direction and it should all start to come together uh, very soon. 
Paul recognizes the need to replicate himself because his time at one point will be over. If Paul takes to the grave the doctrine of Christ and does of ministry, then Paul's ministry and the doctrine died with him. That's not acceptable to Paul. So Paul finds himself a faithful man to entrust the doctrine to so that it lives. And we're going to get into it a little bit later, what the warring the good warfare or fighting the good fight really means. It's all about doctrine. And I asked you those six questions at the beginning of class for a reason. And at one point in this lesson, it is going to get hit home very directly to all of us, I promise. So Paul is a steward. So we see the language here reiterated. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, to you now. Now remember, Timothy is a young man, which was anywhere between 25 to 40 years old, right, as we discussed previously. And so Timothy is training up, and Timothy is often seen in the other Pauline epistles as well as the book of Acts, where Paul is sending him everywhere. He's a messenger himself. He's Paul's helper. He's Paul's student. He's Paul's successor for when Paul is over and done with his job and his mission of stewardship. Timothy will take the reins. And so Timothy is trying that on for size right now in a body called Ephesus. And so Paul says this command, which is a near demonstrative pronoun, by the way, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son. So let's unpack that a little bit. This command, as Paul previously employs, there you go. The term command here is the word parangelia in the Greek, which is a noun meaning an order or a formal charge. It carries the nuance of militaristic language. Paul is charging him like a lieutenant. And so as Timothy is being tasked to remain at Ephesus, Paul is urging him to keep his post. You have to stay at your post, Timothy. And why is that? Why is he having to post up at Ephesus? There's error in the doctrine that Paul gave to them. And again, I'll bring you back to the six questions. Why does that even matter? Why does doctrine matter? Hmm, interesting. And you're like, well, we already know, Mike. I bet you don't, because you haven't read my notes. All right. So the mention shows up in also 1 Timothy chapter 1, 3 and verse 5 as well. So we see it in verse 3, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct, there's the term, command, exhort, charge, so that you may instruct or give orders to certain men not to teach heterodidoscaleo, which is another different kind of doctrine that's contrary to what? True doctrine, the doctrine. I heard someone use a definite article, the doctrine. Perfect. That's exactly what's happening here. So Paul is charging Timothy to oppose something that's happening erroneously at Ephesus. Are you guys following me on that? So we see it in verse three. We also see it in verse five where we read, but the goal of our, and it's interesting because the word shows up there with an article, the instruction. So let me read it to you as literally as I can. But the goal of our specific charge, and he uses an inclusive pronoun, our, there. They've both got commands. Y'all following me? Paul's got one from who? Jesus Christ, and now Timothy's roped in. Did Timothy have a say? Probably not. I have no idea what that feels like. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's going he's gonna to bust me for that later. All right. He's going to be like, no, no, no. So, so Paul and Timothy, as expressed in the plural pronoun, our, have a shared instruction. Do you see the replication happening here? Paul is mentoring him along. Paul is passing something along to Timothy. And to Timothy, or rather to Paul, It's their exhortation. It's interesting if you were to look in Philippians chapter 2, you would hear Paul call Timothy the only one of kindred spirit that he has, which is interesting. Uh, If I'm remembering correctly, I think the Greek term there literally means same sold. So Timothy is really becoming a replication 
of his teacher, which is fascinating to me. And so it's their instruction. They have a common charge and exhortation. And the instruction to steward the gospel and doctrine from Christ to Paul is also likewise from Paul to Timothy. And so the word is formal, it's militaristic, and can be seen being used in other extra-biblical texts to indicate that militaristic nuance as well. So Towner writes, here in Timothy, or rather here Timothy, is cast in the role of a soldier who is ordered out into battle. That's what's happening here in the language. Okay? The weapons of this soldier, however, are not clever argumentation or inescapable logic, things that we might think best suited to, for debates with false teachers, right? How to really win the argument, right? On the contrary, Timothy is to avoid debate. Isn't that interesting? He's to avoid debates, which we see this in 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 through 25. Nor is the soldier's objective the destruction of his opponent. Interesting. And we'll see that whenever we read of two characters here in a little bit as well. Appropriate strategy includes instructing, correcting erroneous views, and urging to a change of mind. So there's a specific way that Timothy is charged to be a soldier. He's not going in there guns blazing and just smacking people upside the head with, like I don't know, like a stick or something, or with like a palm branch. Did you guys see this? Pastor Bush gave this to me. It's Palm Sunday, by the way. So this one's, this one's looking pretty sad, though. So I might need to put it, put it, in, some, put it in some water. So Paul, uh, Paul doesn't instruct Timothy to do that. In fact, Paul gives him specific instructions to be a certain type of lieutenant or soldier when he deals with these issues in Ephesus. So the weapons for this fight is really the gospel and godly concern for the spiritual condition of the opponent. It's an interesting take. The goal is to protect the faith of those whom the false teachers seek to influence. It's not just a protection of the doctrine, it's also a protection at Ephesus of the people consuming the doctrine. The way that Paul sees it and the way that Timothy is being told to see it is there is a flock there. And he's the shepherd. And there are wolves. And so as Timothy goes in, he's got a very specific way as to how to deal with those wolves. But he notices and notes that he has to protect not only the content of the doctrine, but also the people there as well. He's got that specific way that he does it. But unfortunately, at this point, there's probably some that have already been hoodwinked into believing a different kind of gospel or doctrine. And so another goal of Timothy's is more than likely to win back those who have strayed. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of the instruction, right? Love from a pure heart, good conscience and sincere faith. Only the gospel is sufficient for such work. As Paul has just gotten, or Paul rather, has just taken great care to illustrate in 1 Timothy 1, 11 through 16. So that is a towner on 1 and 2 Timothy. So, continuing on, let's look at this word, I entrust to you. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. <laughs> it is interesting to me, this term, I entrust to you, this phrase. Paul uses that very same language in his second letter, as well, to his protege, Timothy. So if you wouldn't mind, flip over to 2 Timothy 1.14. And while you're going there, I will start to ease us into it. So he says this. He says, retain the standard of sound words. Y'all see that? Sound words, which you have heard from me. So obviously, Timothy has been consuming these things from Paul. Paul is Timothy's guy. The buck stops with Paul for Timothy. Okay? So, retain the standard of sound words, which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And then he uses this, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And it says the treasure. Y'all see that? That word, the treasure, which has been entrusted to you. That is so fascinating to me because the word trust, treasure there, rather, is 
literally the good deposit. The good deposit, like a transaction has been made between Paul and Timothy. Very interesting. Very interesting. To me, at least. So, let's back up a moment and reiterate what's being said here and what's going on. So, Paul has given something to Timothy. Agreed? So, Paul's giving something to Timothy, and Paul calls it literally, Timothy, it's a good deposit that I've given you. This is an allusion to something of value that has been entrusted to Timothy to take care of and to steward. Also in agreement? Pretty straightforward. And I'm here today to submit to you in this room, Southwood Bible Church, that the very best deposit that you could ever receive in the context of a church is what you learn from this pulpit. The good deposit. There are a lot of things that intrigue people about churches. But there is one purpose for the church, and that is to equip and to build up the saints in the word of God. Amen? So that we can do what? Be his body outside of these walls. I'm not going to try and put a percentage on it, but I'm sure that I could go find a book that would say that a very high percentage of people that will come into the church walls are people that have been affected and impacted by the truth of God's word from people like you outside this church. But the temptation is to be like, I really need to reach that person. I need to pull them in to listen to my pastor. So what that's communicating really is I'm going to bring you out of your comfort zone, and I hope that you're willing, friend, to come onto my turf for you to get the opportunity to hear the good news of Christ. And I'll be comfortable because I'll know everyone, and you'll know me only. Interesting. So we're learning hermeneutics and we're replicating and we're teaching doctrine. We're giving the good deposit because there's also a stewardship going on right now as we speak with me. And it's not about me. It's rather the content of what I'm saying and all of you. A good deposit. So let's, let's keep looking here. So that word entrusted in 2 Timothy is not translated from the Greek word or entrusted, but really the literal expression here that Paul's communicating is guard the good deposit, right? So Paul's got this instruction for him to guard it, and that also speaks to the nuance of the lieutenant, right? The militaristic nuance. So take a look two verses up from there. So we were reading in 2 Timothy 1.14, right? And so we should be in 1.12. And I hope that that's right. And you're going to be like, Mike, it's not right. So hold on, let me check. Yeah, there it is. So let's read that. If I can go back there. Hang on. Lose my place. So listen to this language. It's very similar. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know, don't miss this, for I know whom. I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard. Do you see that word? To guard what I have entrusted to him. Interesting. So you mean that Paul has entrusted something to Jesus Christ? Himself. Also, so of all of us. And I love that language. Paul camps on it. He says, I don't think you can get, I'm getting goosebumps. I don't think you can get more direct and powerful than that. He goes, he says this word, this phrase, I know. Hold in on that. I am convinced. And what is he convinced of? The person of Jesus Christ. Not just the person, the character and the ability of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, because I know that, I'm good. Because that individual, that person, is guarding me. That's powerful. And so we see that you've got, you got, you got, we got stewardship going on all over the place. And for somebody, you got Jesus stewarding things, you got him stewarding things in the millennial kingdom, you got Paul stewarding things, Timothy stewarding things, everyone's stewarding things. And the, 
So are we. So are we. So just keep thinking about that. Those six questions, right? Why does doctrine matter? We'll get to it. I promise. So you can flip back over to 1 Timothy chapter 1 because we're still there. Sorry. <laughs> 1 Timothy 1, 18. So this command, parangelion, I entrust to you. Okay. Here in this passage, it's translated in trust, right? But it's interesting because actually in language here in this verse, there's a special instance of this word, and it only takes on the sense when it's employed in the middle voice. And so here we have it there. When this word, paratithemi, okay, is employed in the middle voice, meaning that the one doing the action also participates in the result of the action and benefits from the action. It's an expression of an explicit banking term, a depository term. My brother here, he'd be like, I love accounting, right? So it's an accounting term. And so, whereas in 2 Timothy, you have the expression of Paul's deposit was doctrine, here in 1 Timothy, there's another good deposit happening. And it's the stewardship as a whole at Ephesus laid at the feet of Timothy. That's a good deposit. So what, what, why do you mean that's a good deposit? Why is that a good deposit? He's got the doctrine, and now he has a charge, and that charge will enable Timothy to actively take Paul's place someday and succeed him. So he's, I guess you could use the term, practicing. I also have no idea what that's about, right? <laughs> it's very interesting. So that's what Paul's communicating here in 1 Timothy when he says, I entrust to you, it's better rendered, I deposit to you, Timothy, this exhortation, this formal charge. It could also be, and, and, my, and maybe in some of your translations, it could be rendered, I place before you. And a point of application here, right, is taking you back to what I've been getting at with my initial questions at the beginning of the lesson. What does it look like for us here at Southwood Bible to guard the good deposit? What does that look like for you? And I also should think about that. What does that look like for me? So, moving on. So we get to this. Timothy, my son. Now, the term son here, y'all see that on the screen? The terms, oh, wait. Yep, I got it, good. So the, the term son here, it's present, is a little misleading because there is a Greek term for son, and that's not what's employed here in the actual uh, original language. So I have up here an example of when the term son is most frequently seen, and that is in the expression, the son of God, okay? So it's ha huiu tu theu which is the Greek essentially for the son of the God. And you're like, wait a minute, I thought it meant the son of God. Yes, but in Greek, the definite article specifies that it's a specific God, the one true God. So you'll see it pop up like that, the son of the God, okay? So huios is the term for son, okay? But that's not what we see here, actually. The actual word is a word that Paul employed in his salutation at the beginning of 1 Timothy, which is the word technon, technon. And technon, simply put, is child. So again, he's calling him a child, not in a demeaning sense, but in a very special sense because the word technon carries the emphasis of the parent-child relationship. I know we've discussed this previously, right? So again, pulling back the ideas of mentorship and what, what Paul is trying to do with Timothy. He's replicating himself. He's teaching this student that he has. And so he calls him my child. Why is that? Why is that that he calls him this? Well, it's interesting to note, and we all should know this, that Timothy is not Paul's biological child, right? Do we need to go through that? I hope not. Because Paul is a Jew and Timothy's dad is a, 
a Greek, but his mother was Jewish. Timothy's mother was Jewish, and so was his grandmother. So why use the term technon? Why is Paul doing this? Well, he's putting emphasis that Paul has made, or rather generated Timothy spiritually. So let me put it to you this way. In a sense, just as biological parents produce their child physically, right? Paul has produced Timothy as a child spiritually. And that's really special because Paul isn't his dad. But in a sense, he is. And, in, and I uh, mentioned this in one of the previous lessons. I think it's just really special to me, at least, that you've got this young student named Timothy near Lystra. When Paul goes through there, he probably hears about the kid and is like, I want to scoop you up and develop you. And more than that, I want to pass on everything that I'm stewarding to you so that you can steward it too. And I'm not only that, I'm going to pass my lit torch of ministry to you. That is pretty stinking cool to me. And I have a classroom of five to six young kids, and that is what we're doing. We are passing the torch. And I know that they're like, I've, we've been in Genesis for forever, and now we're in Exodus, and we're going to, oh, don't worry, we're going to build the tabernacle model soon, so it'll be fun. <laughs> so, so at least there'll be a project. But, but they did read through all 50 chapters of uh, Genesis and also all 40 of Exodus. So. But the point of that, why are we doing that? Well, we're learning doctrine. Because when I'm done, my goal, as I, as I alluded to previously, is not to have labored to connect the students to myself, but rather to Jesus Christ. Because he's with them and in them forever and always. I can't make that promise. Jesus can. And he has. So that's what's going on here. So, another stewardship, right? Are you getting the sense of kind of where I'm going? I hope so. So, some aspects. How is Paul doing this? How did Paul, if you're interested, produce Timothy spiritually? Well, I put four specific things up here, and we're going to end on this because I'm running out of time. But he produced him by training and teaching. So I summarize this as follows. He's got the content from the mentor to his protege. The content. Content is important. Doctrine is important. And we'll get into that next time. But he's also got more than that. It's not just the teaching that Paul gives Timothy. It's also his presence and his intentionality. So there's provision from the mentor towards his protege. Additionally, there's a time investment going on with Timothy. When Paul is somewhere, Timothy is there. And so you have from Paul, and also really from Timothy, a commitment from the mentor to his protege. And lastly, and honestly, probably most importantly, is the motivating factor, right? Paul's genuine affection for Timothy. So you have the love of the mentor towards their student. So those four facets, I believe, is how Paul produced him as a spiritual child. So when we come back, we will move into the really fun part. We're going to talk about the really weird prophecies made in regard to Timothy, uh, which uh, took me a little bit to unpack. But we will unpack that in the next class. So I hope that you learned something in this first class. Uh, but before we conclude, I'm going to pray. So let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you specifically for all of the individuals here. Uh, most importantly, thank you for your son and for his doctrine that we learn and teach. And Lord, as we'll see in the second class, as we start to really dive into why doctrine matters and why it's so important to Paul that Timothy defend it well, is that it will turn out for us, and it is the fact of the matter, 
is that we build our lives on your truth. And so if that's wrong, or we're misunderstanding, or we're mistaught, there are effects of that. So God, we're thankful for the verse-by-verse teaching. We're thankful for your provision of your, your revelation to us and your written word. And so we'll, as we continue in the study, be careful to give you all the praise here this morning. It's in your name I pray. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. We'll see you back in 15-ish minutes.